this is Billy Gallo. Welcome back to Hollywood Dreammaker. I am super excited. I have a dear friend of mine, an Academy Award winning writer, director, producer. Bobby is, is just an all around stand up guy. I love this guy. It's been a long time since I've spoke with him and uh, I'm so honored to have you on the show. Bobby, welcome, welcome. Thanks Billy, happy to be here. You look young and strong. I was happy to see that. <laughs> Thanks Bobby, you look great too. So this is, uh, we're recording this April 27th. We're like six weeks into this Corona pandemic. Um, how are you doing? And I know you're in New York City. I know it's a hot spot. How are you guys doing over there? How's the family? You know, Billy, um, we're like everybody else. We're getting through it. My daughter had the virus. She's better. My wife has the virus now. Uh, she's almost better. Uh, thank God. Uh, we lost one family member uh, who, uh, who had, yeah, who had a stroke a while back. The most beautiful guy in the world, and he got the virus and he couldn't get through it. So it's tough, like everybody else. It's tough. Wow, so sorry to hear that, Bobby. Thank you. You know, I've I've been dealing with you know a lot of loss. You know, I lost a dear uh, a dear friend of mine. Um, you know, there's been a lot of scares in my family, so uh, it's, it's, it's a tough time we're going through. And you know what? A good day is coming for all of us. We just got to hang in there, be smart, and be tough. You know, I, I've seen a lot of miracles come out of it, though. You know, it's really been a time to spend some quality time with family. I mean, the other day, I, uh, I had a Zoom call with guys I grew up with in a neighborhood that I haven't seen in 25, 30 years. It was one of my friends' birthday party, and his wife reached out and said, I'd love to have you guys together. And my old crew was back together on Zoom. It was, uh, it was madness, you know. That's after amazing. The Zoom, after yeah. the Zoom call, it looked like there was a fight <laughs> in my studio because it just got nuts. That's pretty great. Uh, yeah, was, There's a lot of good things. I, I spent time with my family that, uh, and, and other friends that I've never had the time to do before. So listen, you know, it, it's, it's not the worst thing in the world if, uh, if you get through it. Unfortunately, like my family, some, not everybody gets through it. Um, but what are you going to complain? You do what you got to do. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry for your loss, Bobby, truly. Thank you. Thank you. And, you know, I mean, I know you're a busy man, and I know prior to this, uh, I probably wouldn't have been able to get you on a Zoom call because I know you're busy directing a project. So, you know, this, this is a gift. You know, I know, you know, a lot of great things will come out of this. You know, I tell all my actors to, you know, really work on their craft right now. This is a time to be reading scripts, to be writing, to to practice their self tapes, to really just truly come out of this stronger than, uh, than when, when they went into it. They, they'd be crazy not to. They'd be crazy not to. If you're not using this time to better yourself as an artist and as a human being, then you're not doing something right. So Bobby, I would love to just kind of go down your journey. I mean, I know for me, it, it's such an inspirational journey. You're, I mean, how does a guy go from Hell's Kitchen to the Academy Awards winning a, an Oscar? You know, that to me is, you know, amazing. So can you, can you kind of take us through that? Yeah, I mean, I, I'll try not to bore you guys with the details of my entire life. Oh, please do. Um, but, but uh, you know, as you know, I grew up in 51st Street and 10th Avenue, Middle Manhattan. Everybody else called it Hell's Kitchen. We called it the neighborhood. My dad was a longshoreman. My father was, my, my, my mom was a switchboard operator at Polyclinic Hospital. Uh, five brothers and one sister growing up. Um, everybody was a teamster, a longshoreman, or a cop for the most part. That was about it. Or a criminal. There was a lot of criminality there. Um, you know, it's the, it's the epicenter of the Irish mob, which everybody's read about. The West um, the, 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 when I was growing up, there was no such thing as a Westie. And even later on, when that became popular, nobody, nobody in the neighborhood used that term. We thought it was an ugly term. Uh, and I still think it's an ugly term. Um, you know, we were all proud of being Westsiders and that turned that name Westies into something ugly like that. We all hated it. Um, but a lot of those people were my family and friends. And, and uh, I lost family members to that world. I lost friends to that world. Um, but it was something that I, I never wanted to get involved in. And so I quit uh, high school very early. My first year in high school, I quit in ninth grade. I never made the 10th grade. 
I was lost. I, I went to work in construction because the family was in construction too. Um, I had cousins who, who, who were higher up in the, in the unions and they got me a job. And then I was a bartender and I bounced around for a couple of years. And then one day in a bar called uh, Jimmy Ray's on 8th Avenue. You remember Jimmy Ray's? I've Eighth heard Avenue. of that old hangout. Yeah, it was, it was a neighborhood joint where all the actors from Broadway used to come. Al Pacino was in there every night of the week along with everybody else. Wow. And some writer by the name of Leonard Cantor from The Untouchables. Remember the old show, The Untouchables? Sure. Leonard was sitting next to me in a bar one time. He struck up a conversation. He suggested that I should think about acting. He knew I was a guy who was kind of lost. And he sent me to a friend of his who was an acting teacher. And it turned out to be Win Hanman, one of the world's great acting teachers. Wow. Uh, and because of the recommendation, Win took me in. And uh, I found out there was a whole other world I knew nothing about. I always loved movies, but I knew nothing about plays. I knew nothing about the art of acting. I just loved movies. And I stayed in it. Um, I stayed in it. I got my SAG card about two or three years later with one line on some TV show. I, no, it was a movie with Carol O'Connor. And then over the next 10 or 12 years, I made a total of about $12,000 as an actor. I had a wife. I had two kids. In other words, I made about $1,000 a year. <laughs> um, and maybe, maybe more, maybe less than that, now that I think about that. But in other words, I made no money. But I loved it. Like everybody else, you love it, right? So I, I moved to Los Angeles in 1976. I opened up something called the Actors Gym, which you're a member of, which I still have. Uh, 40 years later, the Actors Gym is alive and well in New York and Los Angeles. Wow. And I decided if I couldn't, I couldn't make a living as an actor, which nobody would hire me and nobody really was, uh, I would write my own stuff. I'd learn something about writing and direct it and produce plays and, and do that and be a bartender. Um, uh, and so I did that. I did that for about four or five years. I would bartend four nights a week and the rest of the time study writing, study acting, study directing, and do my theater company one day a week. Eventually, we started producing plays in the company, started writing, started directing. And I, I was living in L.A., and I lost my brother to that world we just spoke about, and I moved back to New York. And in 1988, I had a, a play that I had written, my first full-length play called Half Deserted Streets, which you might have read for me. Did you audition for Half Deserted Streets when we did it? Possibly. Maybe you did the movie. No, you, you, we, I did the movie 15 years later. I think you auditioned on the movie, When I Came. When I Came, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that was the, that was the movie based on the play. Anyway, um, I, I had the play produced. So my, my foreman in construction at the time, had read some pages during lunch, and he said, this is good, what's it cost to produce? And I said, I don't know, 15 grand or something? He said, let's do it. And wow. so my construction foreman produced my first full leg play. That's a guy awesome. named Jimmy Rooney, great guy. Uh, and from that, there was a producer from Warner Brothers who saw the play and offered me my first screenplay, 1988. And, and I, I took the job for a couple of thousand bucks. I worked for a few years. And then that little job just led to another job. And by 1996, which was what, uh, almost 20 years after I started, I was making a living as a writer in television and movies, which is, you know, 20 year overnight success, like they all say. And honestly, Billy, I, it's, it's been great ever since. I've never, I've never had to look back. I've never had to be a bartender again since 1996. Amen. So this is all self-taught. I mean, you, you, you dropped out of high school, but you, know, you didn't let that stop you. You decided you want to be, you know, write, and, and you, you started reading scripts, and you started reading, what, screenwriting books? Well, I was smart. The one thing I was smart enough to know is that I wasn't smart enough to write. I had to learn about it. And so I told you I was a bartender four nights a week. And I would just, at night when I come home and on my days off, I would study poetry, I would study Shakespeare, I would read short stories, I would read plays. There was no screenplays out back then. Um, as a matter of fact, when I wrote my first screenplay, I had to go find books to learn how to write a screenplay. When that guy offered me that job on the play, I said that I had to go out and buy a book to learn what a screenplay was. Yes, Sid, 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 Sid Field. Field. <laughs> Sid Field, screenplay, exactly. Uh, that's exactly right. So um, to learn what cut two meant and all that stuff. But what I did do is I studied the great poets. I studied Shakespeare. I studied his sonnets. I, I studied every essay I could find on the art of writing, plays. Not thinking I would ever write screenplays because it was just out of my world at the time. I was just involved in plays. And then I read every play by Arthur Miller, every play by Tennessee Williams. And I tried to understand what they did. 
Shakespeare was the hardest. Shakespeare was difficult because I didn't know the language and I, I didn't know most of the words. And so I'd have to read every line would have at least three words I didn't understand. So I'd have a dictionary or encyclopedia next to me. Back then it was encyclopedias. And I'd go through one line and I'd say, oh, fuck, I didn't, pardon my language. I'd have to look up that word, understand what it meant. And then eventually the line would make sense. You move on to the next line. And I was reading Walt Whitman back at the time, Leaves of Grass, to try to, I told you I read poetry, lots of it. There's a line in Walt Whitman where he's about, have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? And I thought, wow, that's what I'm doing. And yeah, <laughs> you know, you look at a Shakespearean sonnet and not a word of it makes sense. And then you work your way through it and suddenly the sonnet comes alive and you understand what the poet was after. There's something magnificent in that. And when I found that, I knew I was never turning back. It's amazing. So that's what I did. So, you know, to rewind a little bit, the Actors Gym. So you had the Actors Gym in New York City, right? Before coming to LA? Opened up. No, everybody thinks that because I was born and raised in New York. Um, but when I moved to Los Angeles in 76, I opened up the gym in 78 or 79 out there. Okay. So we had the first couple of years in L.A. Nobody really understands that because they all think of me as New Yorker. Um, and then when I went back to New York after what happened with my family, that was 1983, I opened up the Actors Gym in New York, and we had it there until 93, until I moved to L.A. Then in L.A., I had it for 20-something years until I moved back to New York, and now I have it in New York and L.A. Wow, that's amazing. You know, that's, that, that's when I met you. I think it was like late... 90s you know, when yeah, you had something, the actors something like that yeah that was I an mean, amazing i'm proud of the actors gym huh you should be i mean there's so many great works that came out of there i mean i know for me just when i was there in, in the years that i was there you know we we workshop developed plays uh, films that went on to win the academy awards uh, you know i mean i remember yes. reading crash when you guys wrote it and you'd bring it to, to the actors and we bring it to life and we'd sit around and we'd get notes and you know uh, you know even tenth and wolf you yeah. know just developing these screenplays at the gym and then seeing them come to fruition i mean when you when i gotta tell you when you were on stage getting your oscar i felt like i was on stage getting it too you know it was such <laughs> <an amazing laughs> because, you know we really it was a part of the, the, the gym. We create, you know, we created that all together. You know, how many actors from the gym were in the film? A half a dozen, a, a dozen actors that you cast? Oh, no, more than that. 13, 13 actors from the gym. Wow. 13 actors 13. from the gym. You know, you know that's what I love about you. Bobby, is, is what I love about you is you, you're, you were loyal. I mean, you know, I, I've been blessed to have worked with you on... Academy Award winning film Crash, your directorial debut, Tenth and Wolf. Uh, we did a play in Chicago, Way the Wise Guy together. You know, you, you directed me uh, on stage, uh, you know, at the Actors Gym so many times. So I've been truly blessed to, to work with you. I mean, you're an amazing director, an amazing writer. You know, I, I learned so much from you that, you know, I have my school here in, in uh, Manhattan Beach, you know, for the past six years. And I take a lot of those lessons that I learned at the actors' gym, and I apply them to, you know, give it to my actors. You know, there's there's so much. I mean, I I remember one time I I, I think I was, it was Falcone or one of, one of these things. I came in to read for you, and it was a wise guy. And I came in with a wife beater. I had a, I think I had my hair slicked bad. I had a uh, a toothpick in my mouth, and I was you know playing up you know the wise guy thing. And 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 you stopped me and said, Billy, come here. He gave me a little direction. He said, Billy, you don't have to do all that stuff. He says, you already yeah. got that thing. You got the New York thing. You don't have to, you don't, you just, just trust yourself. You're, you're enough. And that was huge for me to yeah. go, I'm enough. Wow, I don't have to do all that stuff. I already have that. Yeah. So I give that to my actors all the time, you know? Just make it real. Just be truthful. Just know that you're enough. And that was a valuable lesson. So thank you. I, I thank you, Billy. Uh, thank you. And uh, the reason we work so much together is because you're terrific at what you do. Um, and But the, it's the biggest thing that actors have the hardest time comprehending, that what they bring to the table is enough. Okay? Because you can't change who you are. 
All you can do is take what you have, what your essence is as an artist, and then adapt it to what's needed in the play. That's the mistake they make. Instead of finding out what can I bring to the given circumstances of the play, they try to change themselves as opposed to going after what's there. And let the director decide if, it's, decide if it's not enough. Almost always, if you trust who you are, get in touch with your instincts, you're going to be okay. You know, you should say something at the Actors' Gym that I, I, I stole from you. <laughs> I, st I probably stole it from somebody else. And, it, and it's leave. If you're going to step on that stage, make sure you leave a piece of your soul behind. And I tell that to my actors all the time. It's like, you know, dig around. What do you have? Who does this character become because you're playing this character? What part of your soul can you leave behind on that stage or in that auditioning room so that casting director feels you? You know, if they gotta, if they gotta get down on their hands and knees and wipe up those tears before, you know, you leave so the next actor doesn't slip and crack the head, they're gonna remember you because yeah. you, you left a piece yeah. of your soul in that room. Well, if you're not doing that, then what are you doing? I mean, all of us, you know, you, me, so many actors left their homes in New York and Kansas and Jersey and Hawaii, pick a part of the world and they come to Los Angeles and, and they try to make a living as an actor. And they give up their friends and their family and they start over and they scrounge and they hustle. And then when you get into the audition room, you give it halfway. W then why did you give all that stuff up? Right? I hear you. You know, I tell my actors, yeah. listen, if, you, if you're not going to play full out, you should stay home. You're wasting your time. Yeah. You got to yeah. you got to yeah. give everything yeah. you have. And, and, you know, I don't even like that audition thing. I say, you know, give them the performance. Leave nothing to the imagination, yeah. you know. Show them, show them who the character is. I, I, I think this idea that has somehow come in to the zit guys that, you know, don't give them too much in the audition. I think that was made up by a lazy actor somewhere. <laughs> You know, uh, I think that, uh, uh, well, I, why should I work that hard? I don't have the job, but wait till they pay me. We're going to wait till they pay you. They ain't going to get pay you because you're not going to get the job. Okay. I, I, I don't like auditions. Nobody likes auditions. But if it has to be done, then do it better than the next guy. Walk in the room, say, this is who I am. Hit your mark, say the line, deliver your soul and walk out the door. That's the guy I want to work with or the girl I want to work with. You know, I always say, make them feel what, you know, when I look at a piece of material in that audition, it's like, what am I supposed to make them feel? Am I supposed to make them laugh? Am I, am I supposed to make them cry? Am I supposed to scare the crap out of them? You know, and then I, I go after that. I don't, I don't know if you remember this, but when I auditioned for Crash, you know, the scene was a police over, you know, pulling over Terrence Howard's character and tell him to step out of the vehicle, let me see your hands and, you know, and I knew, you know, I asked myself, what am I supposed to make them feel? Well, I'm supposed to make them feel what it's like to have a gun pointed at them and, and their head's about to get blown off. So I didn't want to go in the room and, and do one of these with my finger and say, you know, so I remember I took my wallet and I used my wallet in the room and I pulled it out and it's black and I pulled it out and I treated it like if it was a gun and I started pointing it and, and yelling at the people in the office, the casting directors. And I remember when I was done, people were hiding behind the, the, the desk and, their chair, <laughs> and they said- I remember I, it well. When I put my wallet away, they said, that was the scariest wallet we've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> but I made but that's feel. a smart move. You know, people, you know, actors say all the time, I don't have a gun, what am I gonna do in a room? I, I say what you just did. I say, find something to approximate it. Just don't bring a real gun into the room. That's insane. Course, yeah. But you did the perfect thing, absolutely. Absolutely. So Bobby, you know, you're in New York right now. You're, you know, you're living there now, right? Or are you there just to direct the film? No, my wife and I- To the play. No, no, about a, about a year and a half ago, um, my wife and I sold our home in Los Angeles in Toluca Lake. We brought a home in Rockland County, and we're here. We're back home. Um, one of the, yeah, it's, it's, it's great after 25 years. It's great. You know, all my brothers are gone. My sister is the only one left in the family. I don't live far from her. We have uh, lots of cousins. So we're back with family, which I love. And I'm, I live in the country, but I'm 20 minutes out of Manhattan. And one of the things that, uh, one of the reasons I come back to New York is because I, I wanted to do more work, stage work. I hadn't directed a play in a while. And I'm happy to say that I'm back less than two years and I did three plays since I'm here. Awesome. Which is really pretty cool. So you're, uh, direct, you know, you're directing, I'm sorry? 
you're directing Drift. Yeah, we, uh, the first play I did when I got back was I directed Colin Quinn in a play called Red State, Blue State. Uh, and then we sold it to Netflix and CNN. So uh, if any of your people want to watch it, Colin Quinn's brilliant. It's called Red State, Blue State. It's on Netflix. And then I directed a play at the Actors Studio with two brilliant young actors. Um, and I, be, I used to be a member of the Actors, I used to be a member of the Actors Studio Playwright Directors Unit when I lived in New York. And then they invited me to become a lifetime member. So I've been doing a lot of work at the studio while I'm there. And I directed uh, Gabe Furman and Javier Molina in a play that they wrote. Uh, and it was just brilliant, fun. Then the third play that I did while I was here is a play called Drift, written by William Hoffman that we developed at the Actors Gym, starring my old friend Joe Pantoliano. You know Joey. Yeah, Joey. Everybody knows Joey Pants. Joey yeah, Pant, uh, was in uh, Bad Boys. He was the, the captain right. in Bad Boys. He was in Goonies. Remember in Goonies? In Goonies, in The Matrix. And Joey, Joey's been in everything. Midnight Run. Yeah, yeah he, he won an Emmy for The Sopranos. So unfortunately, we were due to open up two days before Broadway was shut down. We spent three months developing the play, casting, working. We were into previews. And two days before opening night, we were shut down by the coronavirus. Wow. So I don't know what will happen with that play. Uh, but I have another one on my plate written by Lyle Kessler, who's a great, great writer who wrote Orphan. So Lyle and I are developing something together at the Actors Studio. So one of the reasons for coming back to New York was to do more plays. And thank God I am, along with my you know, film and television work. That's great. Send my love to Barbara. I used to love coming over your house for Sunday meatballs. A positive. <laughs> yeah. She still does it. Uh, you know, every every actor in Los Angeles looked for those invitations when Barbara was making sauce. Oh, that was great. Yeah, yeah. She, you, guys, yeah. you guys fed me. I got to tell you, Bobby, you know, there was times, you know, I, I, as a young actor, you know, when I was struggling and, uh, you know, I'd go to the gym and, you know, the dues were like like nothing, but sometimes I didn't have it. I had I didn't have the money for dues, and and I remember you know kind of being a little embarrassed and saying you know Bobby I don't have the the dues this month to to go to the you know the gym, and you used to tell me you know what you just show up and you do your best work and you leave a piece of your soul on that stage, and that's enough for me. And I thank you for that, Bobby, because you know now I do that here at my studio. I have actors come to me all the time. Yeah, I can't I can't afford it. And I say you know I say the same exact thing that you told me. So I'm, I'm you know playing it forward. Thank you. That's what it's about. Win Handman did it for me. I did it for you. You do it for them. That's what it's all about. Thank you for that, though, Billy. Thanks for mentioning it. You know, it's, it, it, money's not the important thing. It, it can't be. If money is what's driving you, go do something else. So what advice do you have for aspiring writers? Aspiring writers? Well, the first advice I have is to write. Write. Continually write. Uh, you know, there's, a, there's this, as I said before, there's this baloney about not giving everything in an audition. Well, also there's this baloney in writing where people say, you know, I, I've got, you know, I think I've got writer's uh, block, you know. I, you know, I gotta wait for the inspiration. Garbage, garbage. There's a, there's a wonderful quote from Jimmy Breslin to Pete Hamill in the special that's out now about the two of them. Pete Hamill said to Jimmy Breslin one time, you know, I can't write. It's been days. I have writer's block. And Jimmy Breslin said to him, you're not important enough to have writer's block. Go home and write. <laughs> so it's a great bit of humility for all of us. Put away the balloon. Get to your desk or your table or wherever it is that you write and write every day. Okay? That's the only way you become a better writer. And then when you're not writing, read about writing. When you're not reading about writing, read writers. It's got to become your life. That's my advice. If it's not your life, don't do it because it's too hard. You can't do 80%. You can't do 90%. You got to do 100%. What would your advice be to actors? Let me say one more thing about writers. Okay. The thing that, the, the thing that makes writers think they have writer's block or think they have to wait for an inspiration is because they often think they have to write something that's good. Thinking you have to write something that works on the first draft will kill you. The idea is to get something down that starts the process, gets you thinking about your characters and your story, and then rework it, because writing is reworking. Writing is rewriting. And so just get something down that you can change and make better. Love that. that yeah. So the advice I give actors, 
Number one, uh, it's the same thing as writers. Find a way to act. The Actor's Gym was created in 1977 or 78, whatever it was, because the idea was, you, you know, you can't be an actor and audition once or twice a month and somehow get better at it. So you got to work. You know, when you, you, you might remember, we, people would work on plays, work on scenes, work on movies. And so you're constantly working as an actor. My advice to actors is find a way to work. You know, right now at the Actor's Gym in New York, there's at least... 10 plays in development, always. In Los Angeles, there's a lot of going on out there as well. If you're sitting around waiting for your next movie offer or your next audition, you're not an actor. You're not an actor. Go find a, There's nobody in the world that can't find some play to audition for or some play to work on and can't find a place to go into a room with 10 other actors and go to work. If you're sitting around waiting to get paid, it's going to be a long wait and you're going to get rusty. So an actor acts, a writer writes, a dancer dances. That's what we do. And if nobody's paying you to do it, you know, um, somebody asked me something like that a long time ago. And my answer was, nobody can stop me from acting, writing, or directing. The only thing they can stop me is getting paid for those things. <laughs> now, do I care about getting paid or do I care about acting, writing, and directing? That's the answer. I mean, when, when Paul and I were without jobs, Paul and I developed both Million Dollar Baby and Crash on Spec. Both movies won Academy Awards, but we didn't get paid a nickel for those movies. They were both spec movies. I have a movie that I'm doing this year, God, God willing, that coronavirus lets us shoot it. it, was also a spec script. Almost everything I've ever done has been worthwhile. Nobody paid me to do. Now, I have an Academy Award. I could have sat on my butt and waited for somebody to make me the next offer. But I didn't. I went and wrote a spec script. That's what you do. A writer writes, an actor acts, a dancer dances. This is what we do. And if that's not what you do, if you're sitting around your butt waiting for a job, go get another job somewhere else. It's easier. Especially today, in this day and age, you know, actors have, you know, I remember coming out to Hollywood, you know, there was no, there was no cell phones. There was, you know, actors can create their own content. They can, you know, write a short and film it on their iPhone. <laughs> you know, there's, there's so much access it's, today. Well, it's amazing. I mean, back in the day in New York in 76, 77, back in Los Angeles as well, you know, you could get $1,000, $1,500, you do a whole play. You can do a whole three-week run in an off-Broadway theater for 1500 bucks. Now you can do a movie for 1500 bucks. <laughs> the only question is, are you going to go do that movie? Are you going to sit around and wait for somebody to tell you you can do the movie? This film that you said you were working on, which one is this? I mean, I know you have a lot of things in the mix. I, you, you wrote, uh, I believe, a, a movie about Lucky Luciano. You did a movie about the Lamborghini. You, I mean, you got your hands in a lot of, yeah. a lot of scripts. Thank you. I'm lucky enough to be busy all the time. I have uh, Lamborghini. We shot half the movie. Um, a little more than a year ago because the first half of the movie takes place in the 40s, 1940s to the early 50s with all the younger Lamborghini character and others. And then the idea was to shoot the rest of the movie at the end of the year with the older actors for actor schedules. And everything changed, coronavirus got hit. Now we're scheduled to finish Lamborghini in November. Uh, so before I go to do Lamborghini, I've got this spec script that we're casting now, that we're hoping that we can go right to work as soon as the coronavirus thing is over and we're allowed to work. Uh, we're doing that, people wonder how you can do that. Well, with the best guess. The idea is to start pre-production over Zoom, find actors who are saying they're interested if they're free in September, July, which we all think is fairly safe. Then we gotta figure out what the parameters are and to shoot a movie after the coronavirus scare. So it's really iffy, but it goes back to what I said before. Am I gonna sit around and wait for this toll to be over or are we gonna to try to push forward? Thank God I've got a financier who wants to make the movie and he's willing to take a shot and get possible dates, see the actors who are available while we have a crew working to possibly shoot in August. So if I shoot that in August and September, then I'll go out to Italy to finish Lamborghini in October and then we'll do post-production in New York for both movies. So you've been working a lot in Italy. Yeah, um, I love Italy. I spend a lot of time over there with friends and, and, and my wife comes often with me and my children come. And there's a couple of festivals that I often go to, Ischia and Capri. My friend Pascal runs those. Um, 
and I just, you know, we, you, you, you know, when you go to film festivals, you make connections with actors, producers, and hey, let's work together, and then you find something, and that sort of developed like that. So you mentioned, you know, casting via Zoom. You know, I've been telling my actors that truly, I, I feel that this is going to be the, f you know, the future of casting is going to be self tapes, and director sessions via Zoom. Now, you know, why would you drive an hour and a half to to have a, a, a meeting? You know, when you can do it via Zoom. I, I truly believe that the future of casting is going to be like this. Everybody is saying it. Uh, everyone is saying that uh, you better start doing your Zoom sessions now. You better get your monologues ready. You better get figure out how to do it because that's what it looks like. Um, I will right now. We're just casting names, so I'm not auditioning actors. I'm just casting leads. But I'm going to assume that's how we do this as well. Certainly during the coronavirus care, uh, that's the way we'll do it. So yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I created a 30-day self-tape challenge, a free thing for my actors during the, you know, this pandemic because I, I don't want them sitting at home not doing anything. And, you know, if they can't afford classes because they're bartenders or waiters or they work at a gym, you know, that doesn't mean you stop working on your craft. You know, this is, uh, this is a time where you should be really working on those self-tapes, you know, learning, learn lighting, learn editing, learn, you know, write, write monologues, just keep working on their crafts. Whatever you have to do, and, and you know, with the actors' gym, I told you we have New York and Los Angeles, right? Um, because of what's gone on here, and we can't get together for the first time. I'm able to have New York writers and directors and actors work with the Los Angeles writers and directors and actors on Zoom. So it's one big actors' gym, and we, you know, we meet twice a week on Zoom. You know, uh, I'm so going that. <laughs> That's yeah, awesome. anytime you want, Billy. We have, what we're doing is, uh, we, we, we're doing the regular Actors Gym on Monday nights, and then I'm bringing in guest speakers on the, the Saturday session. Uh, this week was Colin Quinn talking about writing and developing one-man shows. Next week, uh, we're doing a piece on Shakespeare. My friend Harry Lennox is talking about the actor's approach to Shakespeare. Uh, so, you know, we're all, you know, I put my money where my mouth is. I'm doing what I'm telling everybody else to do, keep working. What advice, would you give to somebody who wants to direct? I mean, I know, you know, you, you, you're, you've done acting, so you know the craft of acting, and when you're directing an actor, what advice would you give them? I think the first thing I would do is if you're not an actor and you want to direct, take some acting lessons. But if you are an actor, um, yeah, you, you, if you want to try to direct without knowing what an actor does for a living, you're going to be in big trouble. Um, but if you are an actor, know something about the craft of acting, start directing actors on stage first. Pick a two-character scene, pick a three-character scene, nothing too big, and learn what it takes to communicate with the actor, actress, during the process, to, you know, to learn how it works. That's the first thing I would say before moving on to films. Second thing I would say is read a couple of really great books. The first book is on directing by Harold Klerman. Uh, I would also read uh, Sidney, um, Sidney Lumet's Making Movies which is quite wonderful on the directing process. And then uh, Ilya Kazan wrote a book on directing. Those are the three will give you some real insight into film directing. And then take a course on lenses. Learn, learn what a lens is, what it, you know, uh, what, what it's used for, what a 50 milliliter lens is. When you want a long lens, you want something wider. Just know, you know, listen, people are afraid of directing because they're afraid of the camera. They know nothing about it. You don't need to know. You get a cinematographer for that. You don't need to know everything. You have heads of department will do everything for you. But you need a minimal understanding of what a lens might, you know. For instance, uh, uh, you know, if you want a 50 millimeter lens to look at this scene, it's approximating what the eye would see, the human eye would see. That's all you have to know. You start there. Then if you go lower, then you're gonna see a little wider screen, not only what you might see. If you're gonna go higher, you got a long lens. Then you're gonna, there's something called depth of focus, you know. To, you know, just find out these little things that you can able to talk to the people who need to know those things, to have a conversation. But you don't need to know everything. So learn to work with actors, read those few books I just gave you, learn something about what a camera is and what it does with its lenses to be able to communicate and then hire the right people who know more about their job than you know about their job. Which is a cinematographer, your, 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 you know, everybody, your costume designer, everybody. These people will take care of you as long as you give them a good piece of work to work on. And that's the other thing as a director. Learn to develop what a good story is, if not. And learn to recognize what a good story is and what a good story might not be. Something that's going to waste your time. 
I'm going to put those uh, books in the show notes. So any actor, you know, director, writer, they can read those books. They're all great books. I've read them all. Love them. Great. What about uh, great. any any writing books you would recommend? Yeah, so so many. I mean, I never stop reading now. You know, uh, I, I'm reading Tennessee Williams. Uh, it, it's called Mad Pilgrimage of the Flesh. It's on my desk. I had to check the name. Mad Pilgrimage of the Flesh by John Law, Burt Law's son. Um, everybody should read that because he's one of the best we've ever had, Tennessee Williams. Um, uh, you know, there's the art of dramatic writing. They should read, they, everybody should read William Goldman's book, Adventures in the Screen Trade. Um, I'm not sure that Sid Field is relevant any longer because a lot of those rules are kind of broken. Um, but I, I, I would certainly take a look at it. it it worries me Sid Fields was so long ago and you know that was a time when the writing rules were kind of rigid they've all been kind of thrown away and you use what you want now so I'd be I'd be careful with that one but those other books are great how about acting books well uh, I'm, I'm looking up at all my books um you know listen an act of prepares you start with that you know um it's been so long since I read books on acting uh, I spent my life writing and directing the last 20 years, but an actor prepares is the first one. You know, read the, you know, read the bios. I mean, one of the first things I ever read was the Montgomery Cliff bio by Patricia Bosworth, which is quite brilliant. The Brando bios, you, you might want to read how they approached it. Read anything that you can about the group theater and the actor's studio, how it was developed and the work that they did there. I think those are really important. You know, uh, anything from Stanislavski. I love, I mean, the, the one that I follow most of all is Stella Adler. Um, let's see, what do I have here from Stella? You know, uh, re, re, I can't find it in front of me, but uh, Stella Adler, I would read her book. There's a couple of them. Who is your favorite actor to work with besides me? <laughs> uh, well, that's right, Billy. We'll, we'll leave you aside for now. Uh, my favorite actor to work with. Well, that's a really good question. Um, you know, you you, you don't want to you don't want to put anybody else down by eliminating anyone. So I don't want to do that. But I can tell you that I had great fun working with Dennis Hopper. Oh um, yes. Uh, you know, I, I I did two television shows and one movie with, I directed Dennis in. He was tremendously special. Um, I had great fun working with Don Cheadle um, on, on Crash. I mean, just so, you know, so many good actors. Those are the two that, that pop in right up front. I just, yeah, you know, when you said Dennis Hopper, you know, when, when we were doing 10th and Wolf in Pittsburgh, uh, I had one of the most incredible days of my life when I went to the Dennis Hopper exhibit with him and, you know, got to, uh, you know, the Andy Warhol exhibit and there was a, photo booth and I got in there with Dennis Hopper and you know we put a dollar in and we made silly faces <laughs> and then we went to a Pittsburgh Pirates game but the at the end of the night we had a poker game I don't know if you remember that poker game we had I in do remember. the hotel room it was Dennis Hopper me you Tony Luke and it was just I lost my shirt that <laughs> that that night to Dennis Hopper no, 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 not to remember I remember winning a big hand and i remember saying i'm going to win the rest of the hand so dennis can go back home and learn his lines for tomorrow and after a beat dennis said there are not that many <laughs> oh. dennis was great I, I i must say i really enjoyed working with him i love him yeah i you know he's he was truly uh a sweetheart of a man you know to, to be a legend to have the history you know working with you know james dean and you know, Brando, I mean, he, he was just a, 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 such, such a sweetheart, you know, God rest his soul. He was just a great, great man. You know, it's just an amazing photographer and, and his paintings. Remember his paintings? I was blown away by his artwork. Yeah, Dennis was special. You know, what can you say? He, he's gone, we love him, and uh, he'll always be with us. Yeah. So... Dream project. Do you have a dream project? Something that you really, really want to do? You know, um, I have one project that I've worked on for 25 years. Uh, that I just, every time I walk away from it, I come back to it. Uh, I, I want to tell the story of Casey Jones, a railroad engineer, and the story of the Johnstown flood. 
Uh, if you don't know what that was, take a look at it. And I put, took those two legends and tried to put them together in a movie. And I came, I've come close a couple of times to uh, getting some studios interested, but it scares people, you know, the Johnstown flood. Think about what that means. John, you know, 2,500 people died in a flood. How big is a flood? So it's a difficult one to get made, but uh, I'll stay with it until uh, I'm, I'm long gone. But that's the one I'd like to try to get done at some point. That's great. So you also just uh, wrote a piece about the first Italian-American police officer that took on the mob? What, what is that story? Yeah, um, actually that was a while back. Um, there's an old movie called The Black Hand. I don't know if you remember that movie with Ernest Borgnine, The Black Hand. Yeah. You know, that was a, it was a mini series that, uh, that I wrote with another writer and we sold it to NBC as a six part series. Um, unfortunately, it's one of those ones that didn't get done, but uh, his name is uh, Petrosino, Joseph Petrosino, who is the an Italian Ameri Italian who came over to live in New York, bachelor. You know, he decided he wanted to be a policeman, and he took on the mafia in New York ahead of everyone else. And uh, then he went over to Italy to try to do the same thing over there in Sicily, and he was murdered in Sicily. Sicily. He's a great Italian American hero. Uh, his story was made once with Ernest Borgnine. We tried to do it as a TV series, and almost got done, but didn't quite get there. It's a shame. It sounds really interesting. Yeah, you can look him up, Joseph Petrosino, and look up The Black Hand. It was quite a wonderful movie with Ernest Borgnine. Well, look it up. You know, The Black Hand is the forerunner of the mafia. Do you, did, did you remember yeah. that? Do you ever hear about that? Sure. Back in the day, before there was something called the mafia, the, these, these criminals would drop off a note telling store owners, you need to give us this much money or something bad will happen. And it was always a black hand imprinted on the note. <laughs> I didn't know the story behind it. That's amazing. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it's a wonderful story. Some people should look, look up Petrosino. He's a great American hero and everybody should know about him. Bobby, I can't, you know, I, wanna, I don't want to go too long. I don't want to wrap, wrap things up here a little bit, but I can't thank you enough for, you know, just sharing your wealth of knowledge and your, your journey and your story. You're such an inspiration. I mean, I, you know, for me, you know, the dream, the Oscar, you know, you made that a reality, man. You made it like, wow, I know, I have a friend. That, I, I, I want to tell a funny story is, right after you won the Oscar, I ran into you in Toluca Lake and I said, hey, Bobby, I want to see that Oscar. And I remember you went into like a car, you came out with a brown paper bag, it looked like you had a 40 in it. <laughs> and then you pull out an Oscar out of this brown paper bag. I thought it was priceless. You know, I still uh, have that picture good, of me. I have that huh? picture of me. I still have that picture of, of me and you outside the coffee shop holding the Oscar in my office. You know, and, and, and that's it's inspirational. Hey, well, yeah. thank you, Billy, and thanks for doing this today. Good. Thank you. But, you know, you wrote your ticket. You did it. You made that shit happen. You said, you know what? I'm gonna take it, I'm gonna educate myself, I'm gonna learn the craft of writing, I'm gonna write, 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 and you wrote yourself a ticket to the Oscars and you won the Academy Award. And not that, and before that, you won Best Picture for Million Dollar Baby. So what, you have two Oscars back to back, you know, two, two Best Pictures. You know, that's an amazing feat, Bobby. And, and, you know, you should be very proud of that. And, you know, not to mention the, you know, 30 other awards that you won. I mean, I'd like to see your mantle. Um, but it's truly <laughs> an honor, an honor to have worked with you, uh, studied under you. I think you're a, a, a huge, huge talent and artist, and and I'm very grateful that we've had the opportunity to, uh, you know, spend time working with each other. And I look forward to you know maybe something in the future working together again. Well, that would be really fun, Billy. So thank you. And let me just say to your audience members out there, young actors and writers, there was not one moment that I ever spent thinking about an Oscar. The only thing I spent time thinking about was how to get better at what I do, because I loved it. And if you love it enough, if the Oscar doesn't come, who cares? You're spending your life doing something you love, and that's a big deal. Thanks, Billy. Thanks, Bobby. Take care. Stay safe. Okay, God bless. Bye. Send my love to the family. To your daughter, Amanda, Jessica, send, you know, Patrick, say hi to everybody for me, okay? I will. Thanks, Billy, so much, Brown. Stay well. God bless. All right. Take care, Bobby. Hey, thanks for listening to the show. Please rate, review, share this with your friends. 
subscribe if you haven't. Please take whatever you get from here, the golden nuggets, and apply them to your career. Go after your dreams with passion. Don't let anybody tell you it can't be done. I believe in you. Follow your dreams. I'll see you in Hollywood.